In today's adventure, I exhale. I get on a plane to try and catch the coronavirus. And I ask the question, why not? Why not? All this and much more coming up in today's adventure, but first it's time for a Soviet reunion. Здравствуйте. По русски влас не не вием. Так же говорим с вами по словенски со злим русским призвуком. А теперь укажем на образок. А говорим слова лада нива. А би сте мислели, что разбираем о том. Але в скучности говорим ибо хлупости, потому что сам стали троку опити. То есть прибег моего живота. А теперь видите образок Сиэтлу в Вашингтону. Але размышла о дальшем пиве. То есть не добрый, не? But first, let me explain who I am and why I'm making these videos, starting with a trip back in time to the movies. In 1996, electric cars began to appear on roads all over California. They were quiet and fast, produced no exhaust, and ran without gasoline. Ten years later, these futuristic cars were almost entirely gone. The 2006 movie Who Killed the Electric Car was an awakening moment for me. It blew my mind at how car makers could be making electric cars, they could be making fast, cool, affordable vehicles that run on batteries, but they choose not to unless ordered to. This inspired me to want an electric car. So, back in 2007, just months after seeing that movie, I went out and bought this, a 1987 Mitsubishi Tredia. I ended up towing it home because it had a blown gearbox and a dead motor, and then I spent the next nine months slowly converting it to electricity. Now you have to remember, this was 2007. There were no real electric cars available at that time. This was still just a few years after General Motors had recalled and crushed their iconic EV1. It was years before the Nissan Leaf existed, and it was still many years before the Tesla Model S was even beginning construction. So it was really a time of freaks and pioneers, people that couldn't wait for Big Auto to get their act together and make electric cars. This is also really uncharted territory. There were very few resources to talk to. There were just a handful of people around the world making electric cars from scratch in their garages, like me. And I really had very little information to go by, so it was an ultimate learning curve. Ultimately, I finished the car after nine months of effort. I made a lot of friends around the world and developed a bit of a cult following. And I've still got many friends around the world from that video series which I made on YouTube. I tried to make an electric car that wasn't slow and pathetic because back in 2007, if you ask someone about an electric car, their mental image is something that's slow and ugly and pathetic. Uh, so I tried to make something that would at least if not have a long range, because I used lead acid batteries, at least it would be accelerating quickly. So I created a 144 volt system which was high for the time. And I got 12 deep cycle lead acid batteries connected in series. I got a Curtis 500 amp controller. And after nine months of effort, I finally got the wheels to spin and we took it for a very first drive. And I was elated. I'd learned so much. And ever since then, I've wanted to convert another car to electricity. And there's a saying amongst electric car converters that your second conversion is always your best. So what I'd like to do is take everything I learned from the first conversion and just make it better in every way. Put my foot down. We got right 50k down. So I'm hoping you'll join me on this crazy video adventure as I fly to the other side of the country to buy a 38 year old Russian car, then drive it all the way home and then slowly begin the process of converting it to electricity. You're probably asking why this car? Well, allow me to explain it in the following 30 seconds.
problem is these things are incredibly hard to find in the USA. They are rarer than Lamborghinis here, despite the fact that two and a half million of the things were produced from 1977 until today. In fact, yes, they're still being produced today. The thing is, they come from a communist regime country, so naturally they're going to be really hard to find in the United States. And one of the reasons I want one of these things is a little bit of nostalgia, because during the 1990s my dad bought one, and our family went off-roading in this thing. And then in 1998, I bought one myself. So I have like a familiar connection to these cars. I'd almost given up on finding one here in the USA, and importing one looked to be far too difficult and expensive and bureaucratic, because most of Europe had wiped them all out by now with their tough emission laws. And I looked at Canada, but that all rusted out. Uh, and I was about to give up until I saw this one in Seattle, on the very far end of the country. Of course, I'm in Florida, which is three, three and a half thousand miles away. Uh, but I got speaking to the seller of this car, and it turned out to be in really good condition. At least it looks that way on the internet. I haven't seen it yet in person. Uh, so, long story short, I've booked airfares to fly to Seattle in a couple of days, and uh, I need to go to the bank now and take out $11,000. I hope I'm not making a massive mistake. <laughs> So I took my gas-burning clunker down to the local bank and made my account a lot lighter. Well, that was an expensive trip to the bank. $11,000 in my hand. I don't think I've ever held that much money in one go. There's no turning back now. Well, I suppose there is turning back. I can always go back inside the bank and <laughs> deposit it back into my account. But no, I'm not, I'm not turning around. I'm going to Seattle, counting down the hours now until I go to the airport and get my hands on that car. Now I've got to keep this in a safe place. It's kind of petrifying traveling with this much money. All that's left to do now is pack. I've got all the supplies I need. I'm going to be making this video, obviously. So I've got my microphone, lapel mic, sports cameras, backup USB charger, suction cups, USA map, toiletries, and actual long pants and sweaters because it's not Florida I'm going to. So. I'm almost all ready to jump aboard that COVID-737 or whatever plane it's going to be. I just need to do a little bit more prep in case things go wrong. What I've got to do now is basically try and figure out a basic route of where I'm going to be going in each state from Seattle to Florida. Uh, keep in mind I do want to visit some friends along the way, so I've got to figure out a basic plan, a timeline, and also in case something goes wrong, write down a list of towing companies in each state I pass through. Uh, let's be honest, it is a 38-year-old Soviet car, and sometimes those pistons have a habit of escaping the engine block, so better be prepared. And this is where the internet came in handy, because I asked you guys to tell me what I might need in the event of a breakdown or something, and I got some great ideas. Obviously there's duct tape and water and oil, but also smart stuff like string and blankets in case I need to hold things down. And in order to make my journey across the country in a COVID-737 as guilt-free as possible, I went on to carbonfun.org and ordered some carbon credits to cover the emissions from my flight. All that was left to do after that was to book an Uber, go to bed, and wait wake up for what was going to be a massive day. Good morning. It is 3.30 in the morning and it feels like it. I'm just going to get some coffee, print my boarding passes and then get out of here. Got barely any sleep last night because I kept waking up and turning and looking at the clock because I'm nervous, excited. I just want to get there. I just want to see this damn car. So it's half to four now, standing out on the roadside waiting for the pickup. I don't, I'm almost getting cold feet. What I'm doing is kind of stupid. Flying 4,000 miles or whatever it is. <laughs> for a Russian car. Oh, bloody hell. Maybe no cause for concern, but the Uber's supposed to be here three minutes ago. It's not showing on my Uber map either. I've never booked a trip in advance, so I'm a little apprehensive. And I had good reason to be apprehensive because shortly afterwards this message appeared on my phone showing that there were no Ubers available even though I pre-booked it. This meant I had to panic and get a taxi. I've got to see if I can find a taxi now. Bloody hell. Even in the future nothing works. Absolutely f***ing useless. Uber tried five times, no taxis in my area. Bloody time's running out. I was supposed to be left 15 minutes ago. I found four, I've called four taxi companies. One has agreed to pick me up. It's got, they're going to be 20 minutes. Holy shit, I could miss this flight. 
Okay, I found a taxi. It'll be here in 10 minutes or so. It's gonna cost $80 to get to the airport though. Oh, man, I don't need this stress right now. I'm freaking out. I think I hear a car. There's a car. Please be a taxi, please be a taxi, please be a taxi. Come this way, mate, come this way. Oh, is this me? Oh. <sighs> Bollocks. There's a car. I think it's a taxi. Over here. No, 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 don't turn, don't turn, don't turn, don't turn. Come here, mate. Oh, thank God. Hey, how you going, mate? All oh, right, Jacksonville Airport, please. As fast as you like. Thanks, mate, I appreciate it. My taxi driver obliged, and in less than an hour, I was at the airport. Late, but still on time to catch that plane. Providing I could make it through security. Oh, Jesus. Talk about stress. Okay, should all still be okay, hopefully. I'm late. But I did allow, allow enough time for any eventualities like this, so here's hoping. Well, the disasters continue. I got to the airport, but now my ma mask has absolutely crapped itself. <laughs> Fortunately, I brought it back up. I think you'll agree this mask is uh, a bit cooler, although I'm sure here everyone probably thinks it's Australia, not New Zealand. <laughs> Man, that was stressful. I did not need that. So we got ourselves packed into the COVID-737 and boarded the first flight heading to Houston, Texas. All right, that's one down. Made it to Houston, Texas. Now, I'm heading to Seattle. This was the longer of the two flights, but as we were landing, I saw in the news that the state's going into lockdown in just a matter of hours. That means I had no time to lose. I just got to Seattle. Uh, this airport's a disaster. And Am I at the right place? The state's just entered lockdown. So the DMV is going to close in three hours. If I want to buy this car, I have to buy it now or I'll never get another chance. Oh crap, where's my Uber? Jesus, freezing! Now I'm waiting for the Uber. It's been 10 minutes because I can't make sense out of this airport. Bloody hell. Can anything else go wrong today? The Uber driver did the best he could to get me out of the city and away from the airport, out into the countryside where the Lada Neva is supposedly waiting for me. And about 40 minutes later, I pulled up to a house which had some very unusual cars in the driveway. Oh my god, this is the right place. There's a Moskvich, Lada, another Lada, and a Hummer. And in just a moment later, I was presented with this, a Lada Neva. Although it was raining, it looked pretty straight from the outside, and even underneath it, it was remarkably rust-free. Oh my god, it smells just like my old larder. I mean, honestly. And with the clock ticking, I only had time to test drive it in the field in the backyard. Let's take it for a little drive. decision to make and I've got to make it fast because the DMV is closing very soon and because of the lockdown affecting Washington State as of tomorrow morning it probably won't be open again for months so either I buy this car now change the title spend eleven thousand dollars or I go home back to the airport empty-handed I mean I came all this way Why not? Let's do it. And I did. And this is my new 1982 Lada Neva. 
And there was a little treat for me waiting inside the containers next to the car. See, along with the, the Neva I've just bought, they've also got these containers here. And wait till you see what's inside them. Okay, in these containers, they also have this amazing collection of really unusual cars. Like, Vladimir Putin had one of these. And this is, this is Putin Blue, right? That's the name of the color. And there's exactly the same model here. All of these containers are full of Soviet classics, including this Volga as well. And a station wagon. I've never seen a station wagon. But look at this cutting edge dashboard design. That's just out of this world. This is a military vehicle and this is uh, amphibious. I've never seen anything like this before. Does it have a propeller? Maybe there is where the propeller goes. I love weird wheels like this, eh? I just love this sort of stuff. And what have we got? A Lada Samara <laughs> down there. See, New Zealand had heaps of these. Wow. I remember, and the dashboard that cracks if you look at it. And what's this one? Uh, it's not a uh, Moskvich. Wow. Oh, this is insane. I love this stuff. And with the ownership forms all filled out, it was time for me to rush down to the DMV to get transit tags to leave Washington State. Unfortunately, the queue was out the door. And with just minutes before the statewide lockdown began, they opened the doors. Oh my god, I've done it. I've got the paperwork. What a stressful day. I've got everything. I've just got to call the insurance company and get the insurance turned on. I've done it. I'm allowed legally to drive to Florida and then when I get to Florida I can register it, get Florida license plates. I'm done. Oh my god. <laughs> 20 minutes before the lockdown begins. <laughs> oh my god. You have no idea what a relief after this day. You've seen what I've gone through. Oh mate. With my transit tags in the window and my car insurance sorted I was one very happy little Kiwi. I'm exhausted, elated, a thousand other ways to describe how I feel right now. I have the car, it's mine, I paid for it, I've got transit tags for nine days to cross the country. Something I've wanted for a very long time is happening. I'm really happy, oh, oh wow, <laughs> it's happening, it's really happening, oh man, oh. Okay, now I've got to drive across the country. Please stay tuned. This is going to be a heck of an adventure. It, and it just begins now. Wow. I'm a happy little Kiwi right now. Tweet, tweet. Stick around. This is going to get awesome. Wish me luck. See you in the next episode. So stick around. The next adventure is going to be a bit of fun as I travel across the United States in a 38-year-old Russian off-roader. I mean, hey, what could go wrong?